It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker, and we're going to, from global to the state now, uh, from uh, macro to micro. Uh, our, our speaker, Chrissy Craddock, who happens to be a fellow UT Austin graduate, uh, and she got her undergraduate degree as well as a law degree from University of Texas at Austin. And uh, I know what a difficult feat it is to get to law school in Austin because the current dean of law school happens to be a former student of mine, and he was telling me that uh, the standards that always have been very high have been becoming more stringent under uh, his leadership. Uh, Ms. Craddock, after practicing law uh, in oil, gas, water, environmental policy for numerous years, in 2012 ascended to the leadership Chairwoman, we must make that correction in our handout, says chairman, she's a chairwoman of the Texas Railroad Commission and uh, has done a wonderful job passing judicious legislation to modernize and make our uh, Railroad Commission more efficient and proficient and uh, her leadership has been in large part responsible for making us not only a leader in energy industry nationally, but also making us more energy resilient. Without any further ado, I give the podium to Ms. Craddock. Well, good morning and thank you for the introduction. And it's nice to be in Fort Worth. I, always, I grew up in Midland, for some of you who don't know, and I always say y'all are the counter to Midland. So lots of oil and gas going on in both communities, and thank you for continuing to do that. It's keeping this, <laughs> frankly, it's keeping this state going. So for those of you who don't know, the Railroad Commission doesn't do railroads anymore. So thought I'd start with that because some people get confused, by the way. Um, I was first elected, as he said, in 2012. So I am at 10 coming up on, in my 11th year. A lot has changed since I've gotten to this industry and to this agency. And we rotate the chairman. And I do call myself chairman, actually. I think it's a title. So it's a whole thing. Yes, for the women in the room, I call myself chairman. But um, we've rotated around. So I'm now chairman again. Somehow I always draw it during a legislative session. I become chairman. Nobody else wants to go over and do the work, I've decided. But um, that's, that's OK. During my time at this agency, we focused on some things with which I one ran on and talked about. IT upgrades. We're on a mainframe with Fortran when I got there. For those of you who ever look at our website, we've improved a lot. Yes, yeah, see, somebody knows what I'm talking about over here. Um, we're in the process of a, of a huge IT upgrade and give us about three, four more years. We'll be fully automated, we hope, or for the most part, but we've come a long way. We also talk a lot in my world about seismicity and flaring and near and dear to me, water and water issues and what we're going to do with water. Because I say you're not in the oil and gas industry anymore, you're in the fluids industry. And we've got to be smart about what we do with water long time. And we're recycling a lot more, which I appreciate the industry seeing that opportunity. Look, this agency has been around since 1891. We're the oldest oil and gas regulatory body in the country, frankly, in the world. OPEC was founded because of us. And our priorities have always been the health and safety of, this of the state and environmental cleanup. That's a big piece of what we do today. Texas is a leader and will continue to be. And we're ready, willing, and able to meet our energy demands. And the Railroad Commission is responsible for ensuring that those needs are met responsibly and efficiently. So let's start by talking about money, because if you're not in the oil and gas industry, you may not understand how important this is. But even if you are, the numbers are huge about what we do and how, much, how important this industry is to Texas. 30% of our state's economy is oil and gas today. And that doesn't really go up and down with the industry going up and down. We really are 30% of the state's economy. So you hear about the rainy day funds. Some of you do when the legislature's in. Usually, if they're not spending federal dollars this year, usually they're looking at rainy day fund. Well, the rainy day fund today is $14 billion with a B. Where's it come from? And that's the real key to this. It comes from oil and gas severance taxes. 
with $14 billion today sitting in it. That's bigger than Rhode Island's budget overall, right? So it's a big piece of our economy is oil and gas. In 2022, which is the last numbers we have, $24.7 billion this industry paid into the state in all sales taxes, property taxes, you name the tax, severance taxes and royalty payments. It's a lot of money. What does that really mean? $67 million a day came into the state last year from oil and gas. That's up 116% from 2021. Now think about that. If your business went up that much, that's pretty good for us, right? Not bad, and we've seen it go way down too, because I've been here with the negative $39. But today this industry's got over 400,000 jobs in this state, and we just added some more last month with an average salary of $100,000 plus. That's real money in people's pockets. That makes a big difference in the state. On a national level, Texas produces 44% of the country's crude, 25% of the natural gas, and we refine 31% of the capacity in the, in the country all comes out of Texas. <laughs> we like being the biggest, we wanna continue being the biggest. And that's why what the Railroad Commission does will continue to be the most important thing. Because we want fair, consistent regulations. Look, Texas leads as an industry and as a state in innovation and energy production, and that continues to be key in helping rebuild and keep America's position as a global leader. Y'all been talking about that in front of me. The extraordinarily positive impact this industry has on our state and national economy is crucial when it comes to our place on the global playing field. Where do you think that LNG is coming from, coming, going into Europe right now? We're glad for us. Now, it's important to note that some of the challenges this industry is facing as we move forward. Not only is the Railroad Commission work to implement rules from 2021 in Winter Storm Uri, which I'll come back to in a minute because it was a big change, a huge lift for this industry. But we're also, look, we're, we've got a federal government that doesn't necessarily like this industry. In fact, I'm not sure it likes this state some days. For perspective, when the Obama administration walked out the door, we as an agency were watching 144 rules and regulations they had proposed that would be on top of things we already regulate. That's a lot. That's a lot of dollars. And it's things we're already regulating. When the Trump administration walked out the door, we were watching four. That's it. 140 went out the door. They didn't need them anymore. They recognized that states were doing their job and that this industry is pretty important. Now we've got a Biden administration. Those numbers keep going back up. First thing they did was get rid of Keystone XL pipeline. First thing. By the way, that's already been in Texas and from Oklahoma and Texas, we opened our part in 2014. Real dollars coming into our state. Why aren't we doing business with Canada? That was a fun phone call I got to have three days later with the head of the, in Alberta, with the head of the oil and gas industry up there. Guess where that oil and gas is gonna go now? China, instead of doing business with the United States. This doesn't make a lot of sense. We're seeing them go to open up stuff in Venezuela and do business with Venezuela. Hey, we got it right here. Where are you? Why don't you come have a conversation with us? So this is a real challenge with this administration not understanding how important energy is overall for our national, international world, but not recognizing that states like Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana and New Mexico already willing and able to turn on some spigots to invest in our future and create jobs at the same time. They're missing it. And they won't have a conversation with us. So for those states like New, Mexico, like New York and California, where they tell you to turn off your power when you're charged, but you need to charge your car, but please don't go to work because we don't want you on the roads, but how are we going to... They're all coming here. And they're coming here for a reason because we have an ability to have jobs, we have an ability for people to work, an ability for a good energy market. Look, 1,100 people are moving to the state a day, coming from those states. They see the opportunities in this state, and this energy industry is leading the way. It's important that our government continues to understand that. 
I want to get back to the state legislature for a minute. They're in. We hope they leave in 30 days. We always like for them, but we hope they leave. Y'all have some good representation up here in Fort Worth, by the way. Um, Charlie Guerin and, and Goldman do a good job for us, Craig Goldman. Um, Craig's our chairman of House Energy. We're still educating on it every day, and he really wants to learn. And Charlie's helping us pass some bills, too, so we appreciate their work up here. Keep sending them back for as long as they want to go. Um, look, this has been a busy inter the last two years ago, if you think about it, we'd just gone through Winter Storm Uri. I never want to do that again. I was out of power for five days at my house. Huh, see, not going to do that again. But we're working, we've worked this last interim, so as the legislature was out, on some things because we went in and came in with real world ideas about how to fix some things so we don't do it again. So a couple of the ideas that we suggested that they put in some bills that we've worked on was one, let's map out and see where the critically designated issue uh, things are in the state. We all know where the hospitals are, or at least we should. But what we found out during last session is nobody understood our oil fields are being electrified, nor did they know they needed to stay on to make sure that they could continue to pump oil and natural gas in a storm. That was a whole thing that was found out. So let, we knew, but others didn't, let me say. So part of what we sat down and have done with the PUC and ERCOT and industry is say, okay, here's a power plant over here, gas-fired power plant. Here's the pipelines. We know where that is. Here are the natural gas wells that are supplying that. Let's make sure we know where all of that is. Let's map it, and let's make sure it all stays on when it needs to stay on. And so we've done that. We've come a long way, and that's a living map, by the way. We make industry get, tell us on a yearly basis, and we update our maps because there isn't an oil well isn't drilled once a year, right? It's drilled on a regular basis. So we're updating our part of the map as an agency monthly. We agree on that map twice a year between the two, all three alphabet soup agencies, and we're making sure this is a living document so we continue to build reliability into our system. The other thing that we did as an agency and, and suggested, we had a group called Texas Energy Reliability Council. It's been around for a long time. We suggested that we formalize it in statute. And we added the PUC and ERCOT and TEDM with the Emergency Management Group, and we've got the Highway Division. Lots of I call it the, literally the alphabet soup group. And we all sit and have real conversations about what road needs to be cleared for safety so we can get someplace. Where are the power issues? Where is there a natural gas potential issue? Where are the problems so we can address those in real time and plan for those issues going forward? That's been a real positive. You've now got agencies that speak to each other, which is great. The PUC and, and the Railroad Commission are in the same building, but we now do a lot of elevator time up and down because we want to make sure we're doing it well in Texas. The other thing this agency did that took a lot of time is we adopted rules, which for those of you who ever work in front of us, you know we, we have a lot of rules in our agency, and it takes us time, and we're pretty thoughtful. We didn't have a lot of time for these rules. So we went back to industry and said, okay, we have to learn how to weatherize really quickly. We're the only state that's doing it. We like leading, so here we are. So during last session, I called some people and said, what does weatherization mean to you? Now then I got some snarky stuff, but I'm going to tell you one of them because I think it's funny. And they said, well, we're not on the North Slope in Alaska. And I went, no, I'm not. Now it felt like it for the last few days, but we are not. And they said, so you can't build a building around it because if you do in the 100 degree sun and weather, then it's going to cook the, the, the equipment. So you could do something like Minute Maid Park where the, or Jerry's World where the, where the roof opens and closes. I'm like, this is not helpful stuff. So we had to figure out, and I don't mean winterize, I mean weatherize for this state because we have as many power outage issues and issues in the summertime, we just had a huge storm go through last night in the state, that we do in the wintertime. So we put rules in place for weatherization. Again, first state in the country. We think we've got good common sense rules in place, and that's and it took us some real time working with industry and getting good feed to, feedback to make sure we've got good rules in place. That was an interesting challenge for us. We did two major rules in a year plus a lot of other work. So that being said, I think we're in much better shape than we were two years ago. And it's 
going to continue to move forward. The last bill that I want to touch on from last session is House Bill 1520. For those of you who have gas utilities into your house, which up here it's Atmos generally, um, we regulate that as well. By the way, 90, they had only had 2,600 people out of 4 million people across the state lost gas during Winter Storm Uri, so they did their job. We want to make sure, though, that you and I, as consumers, aren't paying way up front for that gas. And so the legislature put in place last session that, that those dollars could be bonded out. We've worked with the Texas Public Finance Authority and the Bond Review Board, and those bonds were issued in March of this year. It took them a little bit of time to figure it out. But again, it's about who gets to pay and how much on the front end versus let's amortize it out over 30 years so us as the consumers aren't hurt. So Winter Storm Uri was really important, but the other thing we've been working on as an agency has to do with EPA and primacy for class six wells. For those of you who don't know what that is in this lingo, it has to do with carbon capture and let's inject this stuff. Look, whether you believe in climate change or not, that's the wave. And it's an opportunity for Texas. We've been doing carbon in this state since the early 2000s. Some of you know we use carbon and CO2 and we inject it for enhanced oil recovery and we've been doing it and had rules in place at my agency since the early 2000s. We the first state to do it. So we know what to do. So the legislature last session said, okay, let's go get primacy from the EPA because if we're going to get it done in this state, it takes EPA, what, two, three years to get a permit out? We can get them out in six months, maybe a year at the most. Go get primacy. Okay, sounded like a good plan for us. And by the way, we don't want it at, at TCEQ. We like my sister agency, but it takes them a while too. Y'all have the expertise. They said, Railroad Commission, y'all go do it. So our application went up in December, December 19th. Actually, this past week, we got some real feedback from, from the EPA, which we consider that pretty quick for EPA work. And we are in the process of assessing that and seeing what else we need to do to, to adjust our application. There's only two states in, that have had their applications approved, Wyoming and North Dakota. We want to be the third and beat Louisiana. We're working on that really hard. So we think that'll be a real opportunity and a business opportunity for this state to gather carbon figure out what you do with it, inject it all over the state and old oil wells and salt domes and every place else and real opportunity for the state to lead the country again. The current legislative process, like I said, I hope they go home. Um, we, our primary goal this year is, is budget. As an agency, we are fee-based, meaning industry pays for me to, to do my job. And we don't like to raise fees because I feel like industry pays a whole lot in the taxes that they put into this in, to the state. So we've gone in the last several years to, to the legislature after we explained to them that no, we don't do railroads and yeah, we're really important and we, we actually bring in the money so you get to spend it. Be nice to us, please. Um, it's taken me about eight years to explain that, by the way. Um, we finally, this session, walked in and said, okay, we need XYZ to make sure this, this agency is going to continue to work, and we appreciate that they get it, finally. We asked for some additional dollars as we started this session, and they're, I think they're going to get it. We've gotten almost everything we want, so we, we're trying to be real quiet and keep our head down and let them just keep passing the bills at this point. I don't want to go back in the building. If they see me, they find something else for us to do. But one of our priorities has been this session is to make sure our IT project continues. So every session the last several, we've asked for $25 plus million plus to continue our project. Why has this been important? When I got to this agency, not only was I not joking about the Fortran part, but everything was being filed in hard copy. That's only 10 years ago. Now if you go online, now if you go to our agency, 98% of what we do is on, in online. That's a goal for us. It's also more efficient for us. We're doing it with 960 people across the state in 10, in 10 different uh, field offices. We also have found we're more transparent. Everybody wants our data. Everybody wants to see what's going on in the oil well right next to them. 
we think that should be publicly available. So we've asked for more IT. We've told them we're on budget and on time. And they so we finished phase one. We're in the middle of phase two. We're asking for phase three money. And by the time we finish phase four, we'll at least be off mainframe Fortran and be on real time data. And that's been our goal. So we appreciate that. We also want to make sure we have enough people to permit. And just this in the next three weeks, we are now officially in, in charge of gathering lines for this state that we have to go out and proactively inspect them. That added another 100,000 miles of pipe into our world. We need more inspectors. So we're prioritizing our budget this session because as long as we can maintain what we have, we can do our job and be really efficient. Again, we think they've got it. We'll be back over there if not. But we appreciate the help we've gotten. And it's not just from industry, by the way. We got, have environmental community and, community and landowners who all want to see us appropriately funded. So the EPA, Department of Interior, and other agencies federally don't come in and do our job that we can do our job. The other thing that we're working on really actively is well plugging. So. Part of what we've all got, we're all getting from federal government is dollars. They're coming at us from the IRA plan, plans that have come down. They prioritize well plugging. Great. Okay. We have a well plugging program. We plug about a thousand wells a year that are abandoned orphan wells. This has been a priority at my agency since for 20 plus years. In fact, we've plugged over 40,000 orphan abandoned wells in the state in the last 20 plus years. The federal government has dollars available. We took $25 million beginning of September. We'll plug roughly 800 wells this year with those 25, that $25 million that we got from the federal government. You can watch it online. We built a website for federal dollars, and you can watch and see what we're plugging if you are really interested to see what's going on. And so this year, we'll plug 1,800 wells, or at least 1,800. There's some more money available. So that's a real challenge. You know, when you get money from the federal government, there's never a carrot. There's generally a stick. So we're look, we've looked at the stick. We've made comments on the proposed guidelines, which aren't that great. And not only have we made comments, but I joke that 25 other states, including California, have. So if we agree with California, there may be some issues with the guidelines coming out of Department of Interior. We hope that they make some adjustments because that would put us in line potentially for $300 million more dollars. That's a lot of money. We have about 8,000 abandoned wells on my books today. And that includes Orphan Bay wells. And we always joke that if you're going to plug a well in the water, it's a million dollars a well, minimum. And it could be more than that, depending on the issues you see as you get in these wells. So well plugging is a priority for us, but we want to make sure the federal government doesn't tell us what to do and change our program, that they appreciate that we've got a good program and that we can work within the guidelines. And our congressional delegation has been helpful. Department of Interior, the secretary was here about three weeks ago. She understands some of the challenges, we hope. So that is a real opportunity for the state to continue, again, moving forward and protect the environment long term for us. Look, to wrap up, it's important to recognize the challenges this industry has overcome in the last two years, frankly, in the last 11 since I've been here. But the last two years, we've seen a global pandemic international disruptions, the unprecedented winter storm, and frankly, an unfriendly administration that's a real challenge that continues to nitpick at pieces about shutting this industry down long term. As a regulator, my job is to provide the regulatory certainty. But the industry's job is to keep the state's economy going. So we hope you continue to create jobs and we're going to continue working with you to do our job. Thank you very much for having me. If I've left time, I'm happy to have any questions and answer any. But thank you all for being here. Oh, she's even got a microphone. Yes, sir. Earlier this month, the EPA, the EPA came with uh, severe restrictions for the emissions of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see a reaction from the Railroad Commission about that? Any comments? So 
right now, and not specifically to CO2, but right now as an agency, we've voted and asked our attorney general, our state attorney general, to file three lawsuits. I just got an update on them this week. One of them has to do with clean air. One of them has to do with waters of the U.S., and one of them has to do with endangered species. So I assume we're going to be suing on CO2 as well. Um, we probably, we're getting ready to probably sue on methane if we haven't already started that lawsuit. You're going to see this, you have seen this agency, and we will continue through our state being very active trying to make sure the federal government, as they put rules in place or, in, or executive orders, that they're doing it with real science and that they're working with us. And I, so yes, you're going to see us be, continue to be very active as an agency. Yes, so, sir. Yes, sir. I, 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 did, I was like, I know you. How are you? Well, I'm doing great. Good. Good. Well, you know, my parents have moved, by the way. I know. <laughs> Sorry, neighbors. <laughs> hey. um, just, I'm curious what your thoughts were following the winter storm. There was a lot of discussion on Texas joining the national grid. And I'd like to hear your comments and thoughts on that. So the question is, should we join the national grid after the, the winter storm? And my answer is, I hope we don't. I think we do it better in Texas. Now, we're never going to be perfect. Um, our biggest challenge, frankly, in my opinion, about our grid and our infrastructure generally, there's 30 million people that live here. And so growing that grid and maintaining that grid's a real challenge for all of us, whether in, and I say that because we need more pipeline, we need more highways, we need more infrastructure. But Texas's grid does better than if you go look at the West Coast or the East Coast. We do a much better job. We have better um, maintenance. We have better environmental controls. And we, I think, have better pricing. The legislature this session is looking at bills about electricity specifically. And thankfully, my neighbors or my, my co-workers downstairs, the Public Utility Commission, are working through some of those. And if we can get, well, we've got to have more natural ga gas built in this state. For those of you who never go to West Texas or who go, on days, where, and that's where we've got a lot of windmills, look, the wind doesn't blow in August. It just doesn't, historically, doesn't blow in August. It also doesn't blow in the middle of a winter storm. Solar's not a bad thing either. But the sun's not out today. And we aren't there with batteries. So we've got to have what I consider firm fuel. And in this state, and in most states, it's, it's um, natural gas, it's coal, and it's nuclear. Those are the three firm thing, base load. And if we don't continue to build and develop that, we're in trouble as a state because we're in a high growth area. Yes, sir, right here. Thank you. Thank you. One thing I have heard um, so far, so I was in Europe like about two months ago, and in Europe, in Germany particularly, offshore wind is a very popular topic mm -hmm. as, a, as a way of baseline because, you know, in the, in the middle of the sea or in the sea, wind always blows, right? So it's a baseline load. Is there, and I know that that happens in the, maybe in the, in the northeast of the country, like Boston, New York area. Uh, is there any uh, offshore wind plans? Is that part of the future of Texas in any way? Um, so it's an interesting question. Texas doesn't regulate solar or wind in the state. We don't regulate it at all. They have to, for offshore for Texas, because Texas was a state first, which we like, so when we came into the union, we control now five miles offshore for Texas. We're unusual in that respect. To get a wind so permit like you're talking about in the North Sea, they have to go to the general land office to get a permit to be able to build. Um, there's some conversation about building wind offshore, and there's nothing wrong with that. Again, it's a piece for us, but where the n good parts are to build wind offshore, we also have military bases sitting right there, meaning Air Force bases. So you've got an issue with their, then the Air Force bases don't actually want the wind offshore because it affects their, their flying areas and their sonar and their radar. So that's not a priority in this state today. 
We've got enough wind going in West Texas. In fact, we're the largest wind state in the country, by the way. Um, we've got a lot of wind in West Texas. What we need long term, though, in this state is consistent fuel source. And while you're talking about Germany, I like that they've shut down all of their nuclear and their natural gas and their coal, but now they're burning wood. So I don't know what that does to their CO2 levels, but I don't think that's that great for them either. So um, look, all of the above works, and when you start picking one or the other, that's when you get into problems, and that's where I think the, cha the challenge is today. Yes, sir. So, so a really brief question. When, when uh, shall we expect that phase four uh, on the migration from the mainframe will be complete? So our goal for, to have phase four done, I think, is... Let me get my ears together. So we're in the middle of phase two. Phase three comes. So by 2026 is our goal. And at that point, it'll be a lot of wrap-up stuff. Um, a lot of the migration off of Fortran has really already happened. And if you go look at our website, you, it's a lot of seamless. When I got there, you had to wait a month or two to be able to get our data. Now you're getting... It's 24 hours behind. So what we allow on the public is 24 hours behind. Um, so it's basically real time. Thank you for coming and thank you for making comments early on about wastewater, saltwater disposal. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and some of the differences and philosophies on shallow versus deep injection for Texas and New Mexico? I know there's a lot of water that moves across the border. Just comments on that would be wonderful. Will you go remind New Mexico that a lot of water moves across the border? We're having some challenges with them today. Look, saltwater disposals, are, you, you can't be in this business today without some kind of disposal. At some point, the water gets way too dirty. This is where we've come, I think, in the last 10 years, though. When I first got here, it, we had to have fresh water. You, that's all we would use in this industry. Now I'd say 50% plus is being recycled, and we're using kind of dirty stuff. And that's good because industry's figured out the technologies. That being said, we started with seismicity right up here, just west of you, with Azel about eight, nine years ago. And at that point as an agency, we didn't have anybody in our agency who knew what to do. So we hired a seismologist. We put new rules in place on disposal. And at the same time, if you'll go look, Oklahoma's having some of the same challenges. They figured out how to go research it and then put their rules in place. We put rules in place and now we're all trying to still figure out and research it. We have a seismologist in our agency. We have people who really look at this thoughtfully and we look and We've also gone to the legislature and through Bureau of Economic Geology, they've put what we call um, TexNet in place. We now have 40 plus seismometers on the, the ground that are state monitored, not private ones. We always like that data too. Um, BEG is also getting privately monitored, monitored data. So we're finding out a lot of more, more about seismicity, which I think is a real challenge for us. And the joke is every time I go to West Texas, we have a big earthquake. Great. I've had it happen three years in a row for me now. And so I think I'm not invited back at Christmas time is what I was told this past year because they've had one every time I've gone. But this is serious stuff. And so what we've gone and had a conversation and are having serious conversations is what's causing earthquakes and what do we do long term, not just how do we get rid of earthquakes or manage them better, but how do we use water better in this state so we don't have to dispose of all of it and we can figure out how to recycle and reuse. Both those conversations are ongoing. So to answer your question, we all thought five, six years ago if you went deep that it would ca wouldn't cause any problems, particularly in the Midland Basin, and we wouldn't have an earthquake and that was fine. Huh. Boy, did we all not know. So what we've gone back and done to, and industry has participated, we are putting in these SRAs, these zones that are about 10 miles out of across that says this is an earthquake area and you can't dispose of or you have to come do a lot more hoops or we, we have to manage your pressure in these areas because we're trying to manage those earthquakes. This is important to us and they're shallowing those wells up. Okay, that's not a bad thing either. But that means, but you shallow up, that means you could have a pressure issue in a zone or in an area too. So no answers become perfect. Um, 
and we look at each area individually. So what we did up here in Azle is not what we're doing in West Texas. It's not what we're doing in the Delaware Basin at all. Every area is a little bit different. We're trying to manage each one of those. And again, we've got industry partners because frankly, industry has better data than we do on a regular basis. We put out a notice to operators in January that says if you come in for any new disposal wells, you have to give us a lot more data than you ever have and we want you to give it to us not on the surface, but we want downhole information. So that is becoming the direction we're going. We're seeing Colorado do it. We're seeing other states do it. And we want to know the answers. The other piece that's going on, like I said, is recycling. And so this past session, Charles Perry, who's out of Lubbock, put together a water consortium. I saw him two days ago in the building, and I said, did you get your money for it? And that group led actually by Texas Tech right now and other institutes and other groups are trying to figure out how we recycle, what we do with this water, how we can reuse it, and how it makes better sense instead of putting 40 million barrels a day, which is the direction we're going in the Delaware downhole. And so to your answer, the other piece that you said about New Mexico, what we know is if you go look in the Delaware Basin generally, they have a lot more water in that basin that comes up than we do in South Texas, for instance. That's why I said we've got to manage each one. They're injecting in New Mexico, and they're injecting deep, and they haven't finished, haven't quit, and we know that that's coming downslope to Texas. You know, it doesn't matter where the boundaries are for states. The geology is kind of the same. So their operators are looking at the, those challenges and having conversations, as are ours on this side, and we're trying to figure out the right answers. If anybody's got some, please contact us. This is an ongoing scientific project that we are all trying to get good answers to. Anybody else? Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it.